University of Arizona and College of Optical Sciences. He has done a lot of work on optical mechanics, but this is a sort of a very wide variety. Uh, we saw that on this demonstration of uh, radiation feedback cooling and squeezed optical mechanical state. And he has also begun doing some work on testing fundamental physics of dark matter, which is sort of fascinating optical mechanics that he's working on. Um, he did his PhD and Caltech in the renewable group, and then spent uh, a postdoc in Switzerland at Lausanne and I was concerned. And you know, I think it's I'm very sad that he's here at Thank you. Thank you very much, Walt. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time actually on campus. I can see some people fidget. Is that yeah, that's correct. I'm a low talker, so this is important. <laughs> That should be better. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I might fidget around here as well because I'm not quite sure the best way to look at my own talk here in this auditorium. But um, I, my name is Dell Wilson. I'm an assistant professor at University of Arizona College of Optical Sciences. I'm also joint in the physics department. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit of, in general today about the work I've been doing for the last decade or so in cavity optomechanics, um, and in particular on uh, high Q nanomechanics, which is driving a lot of the innovation in the field of optomechanics. Um, I won't talk too much about dark matter or fundamental physics, but I'll touch upon some devices which, uh, which Will and I find to be, to be interesting um, for those applications at the end of the talk, all right? Um, so uh, I wanna begin by talking about the device behind the title slide here. Uh, if my slides advance, which they won't. Oh, yes, you can record. Ah, so uh, so this is a picture of the preform of a silicon nitride nano beam resonator, um, developed uh, actually back in 2014 by a young man named Amir Gadimi. You see on the bottom left here is a postdoc of mine, but at the time was a PhD student in the group of Tobias Kittenberg, where I was a postdoc at EPFL. Um, it was later published, I think five years later. Um, it's a very difficult device to develop. Um, this was at the time, and actually be arguably now, the highest Q mechanical resonator ever made of any size or any frequency, solid state mechanical resonator. Um, so it's kind of obscure what you're looking at here. Here's another picture. It's a false colored SEM image of the edge of the device. Um, uh, blue here is uh, blue and green are silicon, red is silicon nitride. Uh, this is a corrugated ribbon. It's around uh, 10 nanometers, 10 microns wide, around 25 nanometers thick. Uh, the reason you only see a fraction is because you can't really take an SEM of the full device. This is a, actually a stitched optical image of the device. It's around three millimeters long. This is a very extreme uh, aspect ratio device uh, to address the question we were talking about earlier. Um, so if you were wanting to build a, a macroscopic device of these dimensions, you'd have to build the Golden Gate Bridge across the United States. Uh, since they're comparable to the highest aspect ratio two-dimensional materials that have ever been built. Uh, it's also under extreme tensile stress, uh, roughly the yield strength of most glassy materials. So this is under a, a tensile stress of around a gigapascal. Um, to get that amount of stress, you'd have to take an optical fiber and suspend a bowling ball from it. So this is a very extreme device in terms of its geometric properties and its tensile stress. Um, so this device supports mechanical modes. This is a mechanical resonator. This is a, a very specific mode of this device, which is localized around a central defect um, inside of this corrugation. This corrugation is like a mass spring system. It's a phononic crystal. Um, and uh, it uh, allows transverse waves of, of uh, vibrations of certain frequencies to vibrate freely. Um, and you can trap vibrations around a central defect in this phononic crystal. And it's this localized vibrational mode uh, that we were studying and uh, engineering in this device. Uh, so this looks rather complicated to some people, uh, but it's actually very simple uh, to describe. Uh, if you describe, if you want to talk about the dynamics of, say, the Anti-node of this little uh, localized string mode of this nanobeam, 
uh, it's very well described by the uh, equation of motion for a simple damped harmonic oscillator. Um, the mass of this oscillator. Maybe the batteries ran out. Yeah, let's just walk right here. Uh, oh, oh, it's thinking. Something's going on in the background. Oh, so, uh, so this is a very long device, but but the uh, so the scale length of this uh, defect um, mode is around 100 microns, and it's only 25 nanometers thick. So the mass of this device, the effective mass of this mechanical oscillator, is very small. It's around a picogram, it's like an E. coli bacteria. Um, it has a vibrational frequency of around a megahertz, uh, partly on purpose, partly uh, serendipitously. Uh, megahertz is a good frequency. It's sort of the sweet spot for quantum optics. You can buy, uh, find low noise uh, lasers, which are quantum noise limited at megahertz frequencies. And you, it's easy to, to build a RF electronics at a low noise at a megahertz frequency. So a good photo detector is also available. Um, so we actually like to build nanomechanical resonators for optomechanics experiments at these frequencies. Um, uh, but what's really sort of exceptional about this device is its quality factor. So the ratio of the frequency, which is around a megahertz, and the damping rate is around 10 to the 9 uh, for this device. Um, that means that if you flick it and you watch it ring down, even though it has a microsecond period, it's ringing for several tens of minutes. Uh, if you were to extrapolate up to the size of a violin or of a, a guitar string vibrating at, say, a kilohertz, it would vibrate uh, for several months with this quality factor. Um, so what can you do with these sorts of devices? The canonical application um, uh, envisioned for these nano, high Q nanomechanical devices is force sensing. Um, so you can ask, what's the smallest force you can make a measurement of if that force is sort of impinging lo locally on the antinode of this, of this uh, mechanical resonator and it's vibrating at the mechanical frequency. Um, so uh, the smallest force you can make a measurement of arguably is the force equivalent to the thermal Brownian motion, which is driving the oscillator um, or thermal um, force, which is driving the oscillator. So if you take its thermal Brownian motion and refer it to a force that would produce that amount of motion, then you end up with an expression like this. This is called the thermal Langevin force. And it's proportional to the mass or the quality factor. So small mass high Q mechanical resonators are very good for force sensing uh, from this viewpoint. Um, and the thermal force equivalent uh, force sensitivity of this nanomechanical resonator is like 10 to the minus 18 newtons, an attanewton. An attanewton is a very weak force. It's like the gravitational pull uh, between two human beings separated by several tens of meters. So this device is an extremely sensitive local force sensor. Um, so what can you do with these sorts of local force sensing? Well, actually, an attanewton sensitivity is roughly the sensitivity of a state-of-the-art uh, atomic force microscope. This is an example of a magnetic resonance force microscope uh, developed at uh, IBM um, Almaden um, in California and studied you know, uh, back in the early 2000s. This is a uh, magnetic resonance force microscope, which is made by taking a kilohertz cantilever, pre-cooling it to several Kelvin, uh, having a magnet on it um, that you put in the vicinity of some surface and then um, uh, in this experiment, they were able to measure the magnetic field of a single electron spin by, uh, by basically uh, 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 rotating the magnetic field in the vicinity of that spin at the resonance frequency of this cantilever. Um, and it, the add a Newton sensitivity of this cantilever enabled um, them to make measurements of single, uh, basically uh, a single uh, electron spins and do stuff like map out uh, the profile, 3D profiles of single viruses. Um, so part of the dream is doing these sorts of experiments at room temperature and megahertz frequencies with these really high Q nanomechanical resonators. Um, and that's, uh, by the way, I don't know if uh, one of my colleagues who is here at lunch is in the audience, but uh, Christian Dagan has been working on upgrading uh, these sorts of experiments to megahertz frequencies. Um, so another wonderful thing about these devices from the sort of quantum experiment standpoint is that because of their low mass, they have very large zero point motions. You can basically use this standard equation for the zero point motion of a quantum harmonic oscillator um, for this uh, defect mode of this corrugated nano beam. Um, the zero point motion is around 10 to the minus 13 meters. That's a very small number. It's three orders of magnitude size, uh, smaller than the size of an atom. But if you're from optics, it's actually a very accessible number. Um, it's not hard to measure displacements on the level of, of 10 to minus 13 meters using optical interferometry. 
Uh, if you really wanted to take it to an extreme, you could ask what's what's the best um, uh, displacement sensor in the world. It's it's an interferometer. It's a gravitational wave interferometer. Uh, these devices are large Michelson interferometers that are capable of measuring the motion of large mirrors with a precision of one part in 10 to the minus 19 meters. There's nothing really magical about how they do that. They just make a quantum noise limited interferometric measurement um, with a really large amount of optical power uh, around a kilowatt. But if even a sort of a tabletop Michelson interferometer with one milliwatt optical power, if it's operated at a shot noise limit, it has a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 15 meters, a femtometer. So it stands to reason that on a tabletop, one ought to be able to access the uh, displacements at the scale of the zero point motion of these nanomechanical devices, if one could interact a light field sensitively with them. And these devices are smaller than the wavelength of light in at least one of their dimensions. So it might be challenging to do so. Um, uh, so one of the problems with these devices from a quantum ex experiment standpoint is that they are, they're very classical in the sense that um, uh, the energy of a single thermal phonon for a megahertz oscillator is much larger than KBT. Uh, so if you ask what the, uh, the thermal phonon occupation of this mechanical oscillator is in that particular vibrational mode, it's around 10 to the 7. This is a very classical oscillator. Um, if you wanted to cool it, refrigerate it down to its ground state, you'd have to actually put it in the refrigerator with a base temperature of a micro Kelvin. That doesn't exist. Um, so uh, it's you're pretty hard pressed to, to pre-cool a device like this to its emotional ground state uh, using conventional cryogenics. Um, the saving grace, if you will, is that um, if you ask how long it takes this device to exchange a thermal phonon equivalent energy with the thermal environment, it turns out to be longer than the mechanical cycle. So if I were to flick this device and let it ring down to, to thermal equilibrium, and the time it would take to it, for its energy to change by one phonon um, is around a kilohertz um, or, or a millisecond. Um, which is uh, a thousand times longer than the mechanical cycle. So for a thousand cycles, this device is essentially frozen out from the thermal environment. So even though it's a very classical oscillator, it is uh, in some sense quantum coherent. Um, and it's this uh, condition of quantum coherency, um, which uh, uh, enables um, a lot of interesting experiments in quantum mechanics. And this actually, this uh, quantum, uh, this ratio of the thermal deco, this thermal deco, the thermal decoherence rate of this device around a kilohertz is comparable actually to the thermal decoherence rate of trapped ions uh, for a really macroscopic device. Um, all right. Uh, and I just want to mention here that sort of the condition for quantum coherence is a little bit different than the condition for force sensitivity. If you want a high force sensitivity device, you want a high uh, Q and low frequency. Um, and so actually the goal for an atomic force microscopes is to make very soft high Q cantilevers for, uh, for AFM. Uh, but if you want a sort of a quantum enabled device, you typically want to have a high Q frequency product in order to have this quantum coherence. And those are, uh, those different, those demands, two demands are sort of in tension with one another. Uh, but you always win by having higher Q. Uh, so what are the sort of fun things you can do with these sorts of devices? Uh, because of their large zero point motion and their large uh, and their small thermal decoherence rate, um, you can envision doing quantum control experiments that allow you to prepare these devices in their motional ground state. Uh, so this is an example of an experiment we did back at EPFL and as a postdoc in 2015, where we were able to read out the displacement of a similar uh, oscillator with actually a, a somewhat more modest quality factor of 10 to the six, but at, at, in the cryogenic temperatures. Um, using a, a near field interferometer, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a second. Um, we could resolve its, uh, its displacement um, with an imprecision equivalent to its zero point motion in an integration time equal to the thermal decoherence time. This is a quantum limited measurement. And this, in this, with this measurement, we can sort of ask the question, is the oscillator in its ground state? And get an answer um, in the time it takes one thermal phonon to enter in the system. And if the answer is no, then we can actually push it using feedback towards its ground state. Um, uh, so that's a very sort of colloquial way to describe something called feedback cooling. Um, so we're able to make really high precision, high signal to noise measurements of its thermal Brownian motion and can in conjunction with radiation pressure feedback cool this device all the way down to near its motional ground state. Um, and that's enabled by this large thermal decoherence, small thermal decoherence rate and large zero point, large zero point motion. 
Um, and it's just sort of starting, this is a sort of one, one way to sort of initialize a quantum experiment with nanomechanical devices. Uh, so a, a, another big motivation for these devices is build, building hybrid quantum systems. Um, so nanomechanical resonators in general are ubiquitous in technology because they can be functionalized to couple the different, different types of physical systems. Uh, and one of the sort of big dreams in quantum technology uh, nowadays is to sort of um, link different types of quantum systems. Often these different types of quantum systems, maybe uh, uh, some sort of microwave excitation and, or maybe, uh, uh, maybe you want to couple a microwave to a, uh, to, a, uh, to a spin, or maybe you want to couple um, uh, an optical photon to a spin. Um, uh, you, you need to find some sort of via, and mechanical resonators can be uh, functionalized to couple to many different types of force fields, and therefore many different types of, um, of quantum systems, and, and people think of using them as, uh, as buses between disparate quantum systems. And in order to actually use, ha have them be useful, uh, as a bus, uh, their thermal decoherent, their their coherence needs to be long enough that there's no energy enters the system uh, while you're using them to couple those two systems. Uh, sort of a canonical example that's really being pushed in the field right now of optomechanics is um, uh, trying to figure out a way to coherently couple uh, uh, a microwave circuit to an optical circuit. So map a map coherently a microwave photon onto an optical photon. Um, and one way of doing this is to basically uh, integrate a mechanical resonator into an optical cavity and a microwave cavity at the same time by basically making it uh, a fun by making it a mirror and at the same time making it a capacitor by putting a mirror coating on one surface and an electrode on another surface. Um, and so people have been able to make systems which uh, are almost able to coherently convert a microwave photon into an optical photon. This might be useful for extracting information out of a superconducting quantum computer onto an optical delay line. Um, so the, the sort of playground in which these devices are being developed in which in which I grew up is a field called cavity optomechanics, where people study the radiation pressure interaction between mechanical devices and, and photons inside of optical cavities. Um, basically, any sort of optical cavity that has a mechanical degree of freedom can be visualized, can be envisioned as a cavity optomechanical system. And, but a lot of optomechanical systems are basically taking high-Q solid-state mechanical resonators and somehow uh, integrating them into a, the boundary of an optical cavity. Uh, in these experiments, traditionally, we we're trying to create, uh, to get radiation pressure forces that were larger than the thermal force, so the dynamics of the mechanical resonator are overwhelmed by radiation pressure forces and make measurements precise enough to resolve um, the motion of these devices with an imprecision smaller than the zero point motion. Uh, this is an example of an experiment which I think is illustrative of, of the sort of development of cavity optic mechanics based on my, my earlier career. This is, uh, I showed a picture of this earlier and this is a, a more expansive picture of this near field cavity optic mechanical system. What you're seeing is an uncorrugated beam, very plain, silicon nitride nanobeam in red here that's been placed in the evanescence of this little blue disc, which is a, uh, a essentially an optical waveguide that's cut into a circle and supports by total internal reflection around its periphery and optical mode, which in cross section looks like this. This is called a whispering gallery mode optical resonator. Um, and the uh, hard thing about this experiment uh, or about this device is that we were able to integrate this silicon nitride nanobeam within uh, several tens of nanometers from the surface of this micro disc in the evanescent mode volume of this optical mode, which is ringing around the periphery. And by doing so, uh, we can get a very efficient optomechanical coupling. So as this beam moves, it shifts the cavity resonance frequency um, uh, in proportion in this sort of shift is uh, parameterizes the optomechanical coupling. Uh, so if I couple light into this optical cavity, say using an optical fiber, it circulates around and it gets a phase shift in proportion to the displacement of this beam relative to the micro disc. And I can read out that phase shift using an optical interferometer. Um, so we can make very sensitive measurements of the, the, the Brownian motion of this mechanical resonator. This is a measurement of the thermal Brownian motion at four Kelvin with a signal to noise of something like 10 to the uh, eight. Um, uh, the zero point, the imprecision of this measurement is something like four orders of magnitude smaller than the a priori zero point motion. Um, 
And uh, actually in this regime, because there are only 10 of the four phonons, it turns out in this device, um, the uncertainty principle tells you if you manipulate it in the right way, that um, you must, that the most of the um, uh, energy in the os this oscillator is for measurement back action. So what the uncertainty principle tells you in a nutshell for a weak continuous measurement like this is if you're able to resolve a displacement equivalent to a, a single phonon, you must have added a phonon worth of back action. So if you're able to resolve with an imprecision uh, four orders of magnitude smaller in the zero point motion, you must have added 10 to the four phonons. So, um, this, so this is a system which only has 10 to the four thermal phonons. We've made a measurement with an imprecision four orders of magnitude below the zero point motion. So it stands to reason that actually a, a good fraction of the energy of this oscillator um, is just uh, measurement back action, quantum measurement back action, which physically corresponds to radiation pressure shot noise. So that random fluctuations of photons, um, uh, the intensity of the photons in this optical field sort of driving the mechanical resonator. And the way to see this is um, if you make a measurement of the energy of this oscillator by integrating over this peak as a function of optical power, you see it goes up. Um, so we're actually heating this mechanical oscillator due to radiation pressure shot noise. And this is really just a, a, a the uncertainty principle sort of visualized in the optical measurement. Uh, so you can take this measurement um, and feedback. Um, so the way we um, feedback is we basically take this measurement out of our photo detector and we feed it back through a BNC cable. that's long enough to get a phase shift of, of uh, 90 degrees. Um, and then we imprint it on the intensity of another laser field in the cavity. Um, and uh, that laser field basically gives rise to a radiation pressure force, which is proportional now to the velocity. So it's a viscous force, and that essentially um, frictionally couples the optical field uh, to the mechanical uh, to the mechanical resonator. And we can essentially, uh, in this way, uh, damp and cool the mechanical resonator down to the noise floor. So we can effectively take energy out of the mechanical resonator, couple to the optical field, and if you calibrate. And there are different techniques to calibrate the energy of this oscillator, but uh, then uh, you'll find that there's a sort of sweet spot where we can cool down to around, we were able to cool down to around five phonons. Um, and if you want to talk about that squashing at the, uh, at the bottom there, we can talk about it after the, after the talk. But um, if you take this sort of same uh, system where we were making a measurement, which is in this strong measurement limit where radiation pressure shot noise, uh, quantum measurement back action dominates the motion of the mechanical resonator. And actually, instead of reading out the phase, read out the amplitude of the light field coming out of the optical cavity, um, you'll find that it's the shot fluctuations are actually reduced um, uh, below the shot fluctuations of the input field. This is something called Ponder mode of squeezing. And this arises through the fact that when you actually reflect light off of a compliant mirror, it's like passing it through a Kerr medium. And the reason for that is that the intensity fluctuations of the light field get imprinted onto the displacement of the mechanical resonator because of the radiation pressure force. And that displacement produces a phase shift. So if you're in a situation where the radiation pressure quantum noise, the, intense, uh, the quantum fluctuations of the intensity of the light field um, uh, uh, dominate the motion of the mechanical resonator um, and give rise and get written onto the phase shift of the, of the reflected field, uh, that situation actually gives rise to correlations between the intensity and the uh, phase quadrature of the optical field that actually squeeze it. So this is a way of generating squeeze light by reflecting it off of a mirror, if you will. So this is one of the first demonstrations of uh, so-called optomechanical or ponder mode of squeezing. Um, uh, so this is the starting point, uh, along with a number of other people uh, in the field doing it in similar different devices of a whole new field called quantum optomechanics, which has emerged over the last 10 years. Uh, we've been able to do a, a number of uh, uh, sort of amazing things with solid state mechanical resonators in this field, much more exotic than the ones the things I'm showing you. Uh, people have been able to not only cool mechanical resonators through the emotional ground state, uh, but squeeze them. Uh, entangle uh, mechanical resonators with light fields, entangle light fields with each other vis-a-vis -vis mutual coupling to a mechanical field. More recently, entangle a solid state mechanical resonator with another solid state mechanical resonator. Uh, and people are starting to think now about um, different things they might be able to do with these systems. And all of this is enabled in some, uh, to a large extent by um, uh, not only integrating optical mechanical resonators into high finesse optical cavities, but having really high Q small mass mechanical resonators. 
Um, so uh, the thing that's really been driving the field of high Q nanomechanics, and I want to try to keep the focus on these high Q nanomechanical devices, is, is the dream of actually doing quantum experiments at room temperature. And there's very few outside of atomic physics where it's really sort of taken for granted. Doing a quantum experiments at room temperature is really hard. And it's, it's uh, really hard with mechanical resonators as well. And the reason for that in the context of cavity optic mechanics is that uh, if uh, on one hand you want to, to be in a situation where uh, the quantum fluctuations of the radiation pressure inside of your cavity optic mechanical system uh, overwhelm the thermal force. Um, the thermal force is proportional to temperature, so that's very difficult to do um, at room temperature with, with typical nanomechanical or typical micromechanical devices. So you need exceptionally small mass high Q mechanical devices or really high power laser fields uh, to, to get in this condition where radiation pressure shot noise overwhelms the dynamics of the mechanical resonator. Uh, and you'd also like to have a quantum coherent mechanical resonator. Um, and at room temperature, uh, that means having uh, a QF product of above 10 to the 13 Hertz. Um, and that is a, a very challenging uh, thing to achieve, but we've been able to achieve that um, uh, now with nanomechanical resonators. And so back in 2016, 2017, a, a number of experiments emerged um, demonstrating the first signature of quantum, um, of uh, sort of quantum uh, effects in optomechanical systems in a room temperature environment. More recently, be, people have been able to generate more strong effects like par and rotum squeezing um, using a, a tabletop at cavity optomechanical systems at a rather extreme um, uh, 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 based on actually really integrating nanomechanical devices into uh, LIGO test setups. Uh, grab, uh, so, I, yeah. um, but the dream store of actually doing quantum optomechanics on a chip scale is still sort of outstanding. And, it, and it's really driving the desire to make really high Q nanomechanical resonators. Uh, so um, I wanna focus on a, a set of devices here. Let me see if this will work now, yeah. Um, that is being pursued in the, in, in the context of uh, doing quantum optimal mechanics at room temperature. Um, and these uh, are uh, nanomechanical resonators made out of uh, strained thin film material. So this is typically silicon nitride. Um, uh, the nanobeam I showed you is an example in the beginning of this talk is an, is an example of one of them. They're either strings or membranes. Um, um, made out of this uh, strained silicon nitride, and they have very large uh, uh, aspect ratios, very high tensile stress, and they're patterned in different ways in order to create localized modes that uh, uh, that have very high Q due to an effect called dissipation dilution, which I want to describe. Um, uh, these devices have, again, frequencies of megahertz, quality factors of 10 to the 8 to even 10 to the 10 nowadays, Q frequency products in excess of 10 to the 14 hertz, thermal force sensitivities of several attanewtons, and this makes them uh, accessible to weak radiation pressure forces and masses of anywhere from tens of picograms to a few nanograms. Uh, just to give you a little landscape before I describe these devices in more detail, uh, the, the device I showed you at the beginning of the talk is sort of the um, is very anomalous from the standpoint of the uh, typical behavior of mechanical resonators over many different or a very large mass scale as of 2014. So this is a plot of Q versus mode volume for many different types of solid state mechanical resonators uh, back in 2014, varying from carbon nanotubes to sort of uh, AFM cantilevers to MEMS devices uh, to uh, test masses and gravitational wave interferometers. What you can see here is that typically uh, phenomenologically, the, the quality factor scales is the cubic root of the volume. So this is like the sur service to volume effect. The anomaly here in green here is highly tensely stressed devices. Um, the first, uh, and this, these were not really well understood uh, in the early 2000s. They were just sort of phenomenologically discovered. Uh, if a group in Yale, uh, Jack Harris, and also a group uh, Cornell, uh, Chivak Parpia, were studying uh, silicon nitride membranes which are naturally highly stressed when they're grown on silicon as, nano, as micromechanical resonators and discovered the Q is anomalously high for reasons that they didn't really understand. Um, back, in, so back in 2008, people discovered, if you will, that you could make really high Q nanomechanical resonators out of these highly stressed thin films. Um, later, people uh, sort of at least kind of started to understand this effect a little bit better and realized that they could, if they made bigger structures, um, 
they could get higher Q. This is an example of a trampoline structure where people are trying to make lower mass uh, mechanical resonators that were also high Q. Um, 2017, people uh, learned that actually you could, uh, if you nanostructure these devices correctly, you could get even higher Q, and I'll describe why that uh, why that's the case. 2018, we did the same thing in, in 1D. Um, 2020, people started making uh, these for fraction, uh, so-called fractal resonators that also have very high Q, but for fundament, for their fundamental mode. And in 2021, people started making all these devices out of single crystalline material and operating at low temperature. And now uh, people have been able to get quality factors of 10 to the 10 with solid state mechanical resonators. Um, so the funny thing about these devices, if you sort of squint here is that, um, whereas here the quality factor scales uh, uh, proportional to the cubic root of the volume, therefore the cubic root of the effective mass. Here, as the devices get smaller, the quality factor gets bigger. So this is a really weird and kind of favorable scaling um, where smaller mass devices can have higher Q. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, I wanna give a little bit of pedagogy here uh, and there's more equations than necessary, but um, the loss in nanomechanical systems and solid state mechanical systems in general is a, a very uh, sort of heady subject. There are many different forms of loss. It's sort of dirty physics. Um, they can be uh, sort of generically lumped into in extrinsic and intrinsic forms of loss. Extrinsic is sort of coupling to the environment. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, you might be impedance matched, uh, your mechanical motion mode might be uh, impedan impedance matched into the frame. And so you might create acoustic waves um, at the boundary that propagate uh, out into the frame and into infinity, and there's energy loss from that. Um, Intrinsic forms of loss are uh, basically anything that gives rise to, uh, that uh, turns uh, 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 motion of the mechanical resonator into internal heating. Um, this might be dislocations in the material. Um, uh, it might be uh, 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 interface uh, friction due to surface material. It might be a thermoelastic effects. Um, uh, often is sort of generally lumped into something called a two-level systems uh, picture of, uh, of internal friction. Um, but uh, it's this uh, intrinsic uh, or internal loss that actually uh, governs the quality factor of these high-Q nanomechanical resonators. So I'm gonna focus on these three, or at least keep these three in mind as I talk about uh, the physics of these devices. Uh, so um, how do we talk about internal loss? Uh, so uh, there's a uh, viscoelastic model that's often used to talk about um, internal friction in elastic materials. Um, there's a lot of equations here. It's not necessarily really understand them. Um, uh, suffice it to say that a uh, elastic body can, the vibrations of elastic of an elastic body uh, can be, uh, and uh, their internal friction can be described by a complex elastic modulus. Um, and this complex elastic modulus basically says that if I strain the body, it gives rise to a stress that's out of phase with the strain. And uh, that uh, phase shift is actually what gives rise to, uh, uh, it gives, uh, is what gives rise to energy loss. Um, so if I, uh, 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 so this uh, complex elastic modulus is uh, equivalent in a 1D model to a, uh, to a spring dash pot system that can be described by a complex, uh, a complex uh, spring coefficient. And um, this complex spring coefficient is just a way of describing a spring dash pot system. And the spring dash pot uh, basically has a restoring force, which is out of phase with the displacement. And because the restoring force is out of uh, phase with the displacement, there's a restoring force, which is proportional to the velocity. And that restoring force does, that velocity dependent restoring force does work in a, in a cycle against the mechanical motion. Uh, and the refraction of the energy stored in the mechanical motion to the work per cycle is what we call the quality factor. And it turns out that the quality factor can be of a, of a viscoelastic body like this is simply, can be simply written as one over the phase shift between the strain and the stress. Um, so the idea behind dissipation dilution is, is can we somehow magically superimpose onto the spring dash pot system a lossless spring? Um, if we could somehow superimpose a lossless spring onto the spring dash pot system, then we can increase the frequency without a change in the loss per cycle. Um, this is why we call it dissipation dilution. Uh, so there are different ways of doing that. Um, 
So uh, one sort of fancy way, which is uh, uh, sort of canonical to uh, optomechanics is optical trapping. So we can take a nanomechanical resonator like this, this is a, this is a little uh, uh, disc of silicon nitride that's suspended from a, a tether to make a pendulum. And we can trap it in the optical tweezer trap. And insofar as the optical tweezer potential is lossless, we can stiffen the, the pendular motion of this, uh, of this mechanical resonator without adding loss. Uh, optically trapped dielectrics, so nanoparticles trapped in an optical potential are sort of naturally diluted. In fact, they have no internal friction, so there's sort of, uh, there's really nothing to dilute. Um, uh, some of the highest, some of the best performance nanomechanical systems um, uh, are really based on this optical, optical dilution. Um, a more standard one though that you've all sort of encountered is a pendulum. Uh, a, 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 a pendulum is sort of naturally has a lot of dissipation dilution due to gravity. So if you take a, a basically a, a tether and you allow it to sway, um, then uh, then that swaying motion has a very low Q, and that's because uh, it's uh, the stiffness of the uh, of the pendulum uh, of the pendulum fiber without a without a pendulum bob um, is all due to the internal stresses associated with its flexing. But if you put a bob on it and suddenly you have a gravitational stiffness and that gravitational stiffness is lossless. You're doing work against gravity. Um, and that, uh, 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 that, so in the, if that gravitational stiffness is much larger than the, um, than the stiffness due to the flexing of the, of the torsion, uh, fiber, then you get a very large increase in the mechanical cube. Um, so actually pendulum suspensions, uh, uh, uh Pendulums can have much higher Q than one would expect from the internal friction of the material making up the suspensions. Um, so that's not the effect that's used, however, in these nanomechanical systems. In these nanomechanical systems, dissipation dilution comes from a somewhat more uh, difficult to understand effect um, uh, uh, called uh, geometric nonlinearity. So uh, it turns out that straining a to that applying tensile stress to a thin film gives rise to dissipation dilution in its transverse mo uh, flexural modes. Um, and one way of understanding this is to think of uh, basically a two spring model of a, of a string, sort of a mass suspended from two springs uh, sandwiched between two, uh, two fixed boundary conditions. Um, so if I uh, take this mass and I pull it downwards, then the restoring force is equal to two times the stiffness. Uh, the, the the stiff the restoring uh, stiffness is or the stiffness uh, of this uh, that is experienced by this little ball is two times the stiffness of each of these springs. Um, if I apply a tensile stress to this uh, to this mass spring system by basically changing the boundary condition, the stiffness is is the same actually um, in the longitudinal direction. But if I pluck it in the transverse direction, then something really uh, funny happens. There's a restoring force due to the tension. Uh, and there's also a restoring force due to the slight elongation of, this, of the spring. But to first order, um, the, the elongation is zero. So this actually, this is what we call a geometric nonlinearity. So if you tensely stress a string, then its transverse stiffness is actually, um, Dominated by the uh, dominated by the tensile force, and this tensile force, insofar as far as it's just a geometric uh, constraint, is purely lossless. Um, so, uh, and this, so it's this uh, weird uh, effect where the transverse stiffness of a tensely stressed thin film um, is dominated. It, it, it gives rise to first order uh, uh, no no elongation, and therefore no uh, stiffness due to elastic uh, uh, internal stresses and is dominated by this tensile stress that gives rise to dissipation dilution. Um, so a more careful model would replace this uh, uh, two spring one mass system with a, with a, a continuum of, of uh, mass spring systems. Um, and what one would realize in this, con uh, if one made that uh, uh, extension of this model is that actually uh, this elongation stress is actually negligible. And, and the, there is actually a, uh, a fairly significant restoring force due to the uh, internal stresses due to the curvature um, of the string at the clamps. So the fact that this angle um, changes as you move further and further from the clamps. Um, 
And this uh, curvature actually gives rise to most of the restoring stiffness due to internal stresses. Um, so if you run through the math here, it's kind of complicated, but it's really important to understanding the quality factors, improving the quality factors of nanomechanical resonators. You'll find that the quality factor of a stressed string is proportional to its internal Q, uh, which is one over the phase between its uh, the complex uh, one over the phase between the stress and the strain uh, in the viscoelastic model of the uh, the etern of the material, times the stiffness due to tensile stress, and the stiffness due to curvature of the mode at the clamps and the antinodes. Uh, so, uh, so this. It turns out that there's a great deal of curvature. And this sounds really esoteric, but it was really important to understanding the quality factor of very simple nanomechanical devices. Um, and it has to do with some stuff that we typically take for granted. So when, when we talk about the vibrations of a string in, in physics 101, you typically assume that it, it behaves like a sin, that the mode shape is sinusoidal. But that's for an ideally, uh, uh, a string which has zero thickness. So in reality, uh, you know, all solid state, strings have finite thickness. And because of this finite thickness, uh, the, there, there's a little bit extra curvature of the clamps. So the boundary condition, the proper boundary conditions of the clamps for a clamp clamp string is the derivative has to go to zero. Uh, the sine wave doesn't have the derivative to go to zero at the clamps. So there's a little extra curvature and a lot of uh, uh, internal stress due to that extra curvature. And that's where most of the internal friction comes from. Um, so if you do the math here for a string, you have a nice analytical model actually that matches our data really well for these devices. Um, the quality factor gets uh, it differs from the intrinsic quality factor for the string for the internal modes of a string uh, in proportion to the aspect ratio times the ratio of the elastic modulus to the tensile stress. Uh, so this term is due to uh, uh, curvature, this second order derivative being non-zero at the clamps. And there is also a term due to curvature at the antinode. And you can see the curvature of the antinode is much weaker than the curvature of the clamps. And so if somehow you're able to get rid of the clamps, uh, you can get actually a much larger amplification of the Q due to this dissipation dilution effect. Uh, so a lot of math here, but this was actually not really realized strangely until um, the early 2010s. Uh, very simple, uh, 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 continuum mechanics model applied to nanomechanical resonators turned out to be really, really important um, because we can actually make really high aspect ratio devices under high tensile stress. Um, so, uh, so that's the name of the game. If you believe this model, um, this simple model, then you can go back to the clean room and make high aspect ratio, high stress devices, and then play tricks to get rid of the curvature of the clamps. Um, and then you should, you ought to be able to get high Q. So a couple of examples here. So LIGO mirror suspensions are designed, gravitational wave interferometers have very uh, uh, carefully designed suspension systems. Um, one reason for this is actually uh, the, the, the violin modes of the suspensions um, produce a lot of noise in the measurement band of gravitational wave interferometers. And it was realized that if, if you make the tethers really small, then there's a lot of tensile stress in the, in the tethers that boosts not only the frequency of the, of the violin modes of the suspensions, but it also increases their Q due to dissipation dilution. So actually it was really LIGO that discovered this effect of dissipation dilution, um, or at least used uh, wittingly, it used it in their designs back in the eighties. And it was completely overlooked by nanomechanics until the mid two thousands. Um, so the violin modes of, uh, of, of suspension springs for gravitational wave interferometers on purpose um, uh, and play this dissipation dilution effect um, to get really high Q violin modes, which don't interfere with their measurement with their with their, with their measurements in the in the 100 hertz to kilohertz uh, measurement band. Uh, so these are really high aspect ratio, uh, basically optical fibers, which have an internal friction of 10 to the four. It's typical internal friction of glass, um, and are actually strained uh, on purpose up to near the yield strength, and they have quality factors of around 10 to the six. Is really important for gravitational wave interferometry. Um, you can get the same sort of aspect ratios and tensions if they're very different type of mechanical device that's very commonly found in the clean room. Um, so silicon nitride grown on silicon is a very a standard uh, uh, technology, for example, for straining transistors. Um, 
if you grow silicon nitride on silicon or deposit silicon nitride on silicon, you typically use something called laser vapor chemical deposition. It's a deposition technique that occurs at 800 C. Um, and uh, due to the thermal coefficient mismatch between silicon nitride and silicon, when you cool this device down to room temperature, you end up with around a gigapascal of stress. Um, so these devices, uh, the suspended devices made out of high stress silicon nitride are, are pretty commonly found. Uh, this is a picture of a transmission electron microscope slide made out of uh, uh, incidentally high stress silicon nitride. And these were the first sort of high Q nanomechanical resonators. It cost 10 bucks from a company called Narcana in Canada. Um, but these devices were made not for really nanomechanics, but incidentally are very good for nanomechanics. Um, so uh, this is an example of wittingly using this model for dissipation dilution to make a high Q nanomechanical resonator, essentially taking a membrane like this and etching it away into nanostrings. Uh, these strings have aspect ratios of something like 10 to the four um, and a tensile stress of uh, a gigapascal. Um, they have dissipation and they're, they're, they're regular strings. And so actually they turn out to be dominated by this clamping term in the dissipation dilution. You can predict a quality factor of 10 to the seven, and we, we measure a quality factor which matches the model perfectly well. Uh, the big innovation uh, back when I was a, a postdoc um, was, uh, was figuring out how to get rid of motion of the clamps. And we did this by essentially corrugating the beam in order to create a phononic crystal that only supported uh, transverse vibrations with a certain wavelength. And we were able to confine these around a central defect and basically uh, uh, get rid of the curvature of the clamps. And if you get rid of the curvature of the clamps, this term, this leading term goes away and the second order term dominates and we can get a quality, basically a quadratic increase in this dissipation dilution factor and we get a quality factor of 10 to the eight. Uh, so uh, this looks complicated, but it actually matches the model to a T. And this is a, one of the rare examples of being able to really understand the quality factor of a solid state mechanical device up to a constant, which is this internal Q. Um, uh, and actually, I should just say that this internal Q is phenomenologically dominated by surface losses. Um, uh, 10 to the nine, to get 10 to the nine, you can play other tricks. You can actually choke the, the beam. Um, and if you, if you actually taper the beam so that it's smaller in the middle and wider at the, uh, at the ends, um, the tension needs to be preserved at every point in the string. So if, as you, as you choke the string down to a smaller dimension, um, the, the stress that, produ that uh, produces that, that gives rise to that tension has to get higher. So the tension is the stress times the, the, times the, the, the stress is equal to the tension divided by the aspect ratio. So we were able to play tr clever techniques to amplify the stress in the vicinity of the vibrational mode by just tapering the beam. And that's how we got quality factors of 10 to the nine. Um, so, uh, this actually was this. These ideas were predated uh, uh, by a year, actually, in a different group at Niels Bohr Institute, using a, a device. Which, if you're in, a, in the field of, uh, a lot, which a lot of people in the field of, uh, of quantum sensing, I, I think, are quite familiar with, um, based on a nanomechanical membrane with a phononic crystal. Um, so these devices are very popular now in the field of quantum sensing and quantum optical mechanics. This sort of a platform for high Q nanomechanics. And they're based on uh, uh, strained 2D strings, membranes with a phononic crystal that creates a defect mechanical mode that's soft clamped, if you will. Um, and again, uh, we understand that we understand that the, uh, the quality factor of these devices very well, which is a rare thing for, for solid state mechanics. Uh, so that's a, a background. Um, uh, it sort of leads up to my group starting a few years ago in, at the University of Arizona with the quantum optical mechanics group. Um, because of my history, sort of the platform for a lot of our experiments is ultra, is ultra high Q nanomechanical resonators. We're sort of always curious in how we can sort of improve the, these devices. And we're interested in using the, the, them to build uh, quantum limited sensors. So uh, in particular, quantum limited force sensors and accelerometers, which are mechanical resonators, which are integrated into optical cavities, so we can read out their displacement very sensitively, um, and which are quantum limited in the sense that um, our sensitivity to their motion and therefore the forces which push on them are limited by um, either uh, radiation pre or by radiation pressure quantum noise. Um, 
And one of the things that we're interested in doing with these devices and kind of why I've started talking a lot with Will um, uh, here is, uh, is using them to search for weak forces uh, due to fundamental physics. And so we've uh, learned that these devices, uh, um, which are really resonant force sensors at sort of kilohertz to megahertz frequencies might be interesting for searching for fundamental signatures of dark matter um, or uh, spontaneous wave function collapse, which is uh, a way of sort of looking for the breakdown of, microscope, of quantum mechanics at the macro scale, um, just by making sensitive force measurements, um, uh, typically at cryogenic temperatures. So I wanna talk a little bit about this uh, stuff that we're uh, starting to foray into. This is a very typical device in my lab, silicon nitride trampoline resonator. It's uh, uh, something that I'm personally not able uh, to fabricate, uh, but I met a master's student wandering the halls looking for a different group when I just started here named Aman Agarwal, who had just spent three years at the Tata Institute in India as a research fellow. And I asked him if he could make this particular device for my lab, and he spent an hour in the chalkboard telling me how he would do it. And I hired him immediately. And so these are the first devices we made almost four years ago in my lab, um, and they worked uh, to a T. Um, uh, right off the bat. Um, so this is a, a silicon nitride a membrane that's been etched into a trampoline structure, which is uh, maybe a few millimeters across. These tethers themselves are maybe a few microns wide. Quality factor of around 50 million, frequency of around 150 kilohertz, very small mass. Force sensitivity for these devices is around a piconewton. Um, and uh, an interesting thing about these devices is because they're fairly massive, um, they also have very high acceleration sensitivity. So acceleration, when you think about using these devices in acceleration sensors, uh, the name of the game is to, instead of measuring a local force on, on the pad, we make a measurement of the uh, acceleration of the chip on which the pad sits using the sort of the tablecloth trick. Um, and the acceleration sensitivity, the thermal equivalent acceleration sensitivity is the thermal equivalent force divided by the mass. Um, for these devices, the uh, thermal equivalent acceleration sensitivity is around a 0.1 uh, or 100 nano G, which is a very sensitive acceleration on a chip. So we're quite curious in using these devices as accelerometers. Their zero point motion is also very large due to their low frequency around, uh, an, at a, around a, a picometer, which is eminently accessible with a Michelson interferometer. They also have Q frequency products, which are on the edge of quantum coherent at room temperature. Uh, so very simple experiments that we started doing in my lab. Uh, uh, one thing that we're interested in doing with these really high Q nanomechanical resonators is doing quantum optical mechanics without an optical cavity. So uh, doing experiments with optical cavities uh, has a lot of overhead associated with it. You need to somehow integrate a mechanical resonator into an optical cavity without affecting its mechanical Q. And then you need to lock the cavity and deal with lots of um, uh, stability problems. Um, so because these devices have such large zero point motion, we learned right away that we could actually make high fidelity displacement measurements without an optical cavity. And just as a sort of a, a, a benchmark, we decided to try to cool one of these devices uh, down to around a thousand phonons from room temperature, um, uh, just with a Michelson interferometer. So we can do that uh, very simply and we'd like to actually um, move uh, these experiments to uh, a, a cryostat and try to do very simple ground state cooling experiments um, uh, with uh, simple non interferometric techniques. And this actually has become more and more in vogue in the field of caveat optic mechanics over the last few years using levitated optomechanical systems. Uh, we also have an experiment where we're trying to actually uh, increase our optomechanical coupling by placing one of these trampolines inside of an optical cavity. This is a technique called a membrane in the middle optomechanics um, that I really kind of got my start in when I was a PhD student. Uh, it thinks, turns out, and it's kind of miraculous that if you take a silicon nitride membrane like this, which is only a 50 nanometers thick, say, and you place it between two mirrors forming a fabry perot cavity and sensitively position the membrane halfway between a node and the antinode of the intracavity standing wave, um, then its interaction with the cavity is as though it were an end mirror. Um, so it has, uh, so you can get really high optomechanical coupling uh, to one of these devices, which is much thinner than an optical wavelength by placing it between two mirrors. Um, this is a very clever technique, which was invented by Jack Harris at Yale almost 15 years ago. Um, 
And we were quite excited about this system because, um, because of the high force sensitivity of these trampolines, we in principle should ought to be able to access radiation pressure, uh, quantum flux, uh, radiation pressure shot noise at powers of around 100 nanowatts, which is a very accessible amount of optical power. And you want this power to be as small as possible because of photothermal effects. These devices are also really good bolometers. So if they absorb any light at all, they heat up and that heating up actually obscures your measurements of radiation pressure quantum waves. Uh, first measurement a long time ago, it's a picture of my lab. Uh, when we first put these devices in an optical cavity, we noticed right away there's a big problem. We're still sort of contending with. Um, the Brownian motion of these devices is so large that it over that it's, uh, that actually it overwhelms uh, uh, the, the cavity alignment. So this is us sweeping over the cavity resonance and the cavity resonance is getting modulated by uh, tenfold by the thermal Brownian motion of this nanomechanical resonator. Uh, so the line width of an optical cavity is the wavelength divided by the finesse of the cavity. Um, the, the finesse of this cavity is around 10,000. So that's line width is around 10 picometers. The thermal Brownian motion is around 100 picometers for this device. So uh, this is what happens when you put small mass mechanical resonators, when you can couple them strongly to an optical cavity. Um, so what this looks like, if you look at the transmission of the cavity is that the intensity fluctuations, the light coming out of the cavity are orders of magnitude larger than the shot noise. Um, and actually we're doing experiments right now where the dynamics, we find that the dynamics of the mechanical resonator are actually really being driven by um, transduction nonlinearities. So if you sort of park the cavity right here uh, on resonance, if you sort of imagine a Lorentzian resonance here, um, the motion of the mechanical resonator is so big that actually the linear coupling is smaller than the quadratic coupling and all the mechanical modes sort of mix down into the passband uh, and we just have chaos. Uh, this is being, this, this sort of chaos is being recognized recently uh, as a sort of a ubiquitous problem for room temperature quantum optical mechanics. And we've been even writing papers about it and calling it thermal intermodulation noise. Um, it's, a, it's an important technical problem that we're contending with. Uh, so uh, together with my colleague, Felipe Guzman, Texas A&M, formerly OSC, we started developing uh, optomechanical accelerometers. Um, so uh, the, the nice thing about accelerometry is that there's a lot of applications. There's not too many applications for contact force sensing, but for making a measurement of the local acceleration uh, of uh, your laboratory, there's a lot of applications like inertial navigation. Uh, so we wanted to start making very simple radiation pressure uh, 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 sensitive opti optical accel optomechanical accelerometers, basically by making two membranes on opposite sides of the same chip. Um, these devices are very simple to characterize. They have very high quality factors. We can cool the motion of the test mass down to very low temperatures. And it turns out that this is useful for making measurements of weak, incoherent forces and incoherent accelerations. And so if you damp a mechanical resonator down to low temperature, you can increase its sensitivity to, uh, to, to uh, incoherent accelerations and forces. And so we're able to make measurements of weak, incoherent accelerations at the 10 nano G level. Um, at, uh, at with a bandwidth of around a kilohertz at, at a few tens of kilohertz. Um, we, because they're very simple, we can also start making arrays of them. So we've been collaborating with another colleague at, at, at the University of Arizona to actually integrate, start integrating an array of these devices into the nodes of a entangled light source. So this is a two mode entangled light source, which is essentially a squeeze light source split into two paths. And we can make measurements of the joint displacement and therefore the um, joint force um, on these mechanical resonators with an imprecision below the so-called standard quantum limit. Um, this is like making a, replacing the mirror in LIGO, which is a Michelson interferometer with squeeze light with an array of mirrors, sort of making a synthetic mirror. Um, and this is, uh, this is important for sort of envisioning how to make an quantum enhanced sensor for a distributed force field. And an acceleration field is an example of a distributed force field, a force field which is coherent over a large region of space. Um, so one of the things that we learned during the pandemic uh, is that you know, because of work by Will um, and others uh, over the last few years, uh, there have been sort of uh, a lot of thinking about how dark matter might masquerade as one of these weak incoherent distributed forces. So ultralight dark matter, um, uh, sort of wave-like dark matter uh, might masquerade as one of its many 
uh, light, light masquerade as a weak force which pushes on a local uh, pushes on on objects in proportion to their neutron density, sort of like an electric field, which instead of push, uh, uh, producing a Lorentz force in objects in proportional to their electric charge, uh, produces a force in proportional to say their neutron charge or some other sort of generic charge. Um, and this weak force field might be uh, detecting detected using sort of these really high Q tuning forks uh, that uh, we're making in, in uh, these high Q nanomechanical resonators um, uh, by functionalizing, functionalizing them so that we can measure their displacement relative to materials with different neutron densities. So if we can make um, materially inhomogeneous cavity optomechanical systems, we might be able to sense uh, these, these dark matter waves. Um, so we're interested in using these optomechanical accelerometers for dark matter detection. Um, more recently, we've been enamored of a, a kind of a mistake we made in our lab, and I'll go quickly through this because I know we're running out of time. Um, it turns out that if you study the torsion modes of nanomechanical resonators, then uh, uh, these sort of complicated games we've played to get sort of soft clamped localized mechanical modes, we sort of get for free. And so uh, if you're an aficionado of nanomechanics like myself, this was a big surprise. Um, uh, so this surprise happened by mistake in my lab. We were making nano trampoline resonators. They kept breaking because the tethers would break. And uh, in discussion with our colleagues at NIST Gaithersburg, uh, we, we realized that these devices uh, that we were making, it's incidentally uh, these sort of ribbon suspended torsion balance, micro torsion balances, um, might have very large dissipation dilution and torsion. And the way of thinking about this is if you take a ribbon and you stretch it, not only do you change its transverse flexural stiffness, but you also change its torsional stiffness. Uh, and uh, you only really appreciably change the torsional stiffness if it's ribbon-like. If it's circular, then you don't really change its torsional stiffness. Um, but that means that um, that the ribbon, the torsion modes of ribbons should also experience this dissipation dilution. That's a very ubiquitous structure in nanomechanics. No one had ever studied uh, its uh, the, me the mechanical quality of these devices. Uh, so we actually took this broken device, which had been sitting in our clean hood for two, for two years, and uh, took it out uh, at the behest of our colleague at NIST, and, and we put it in our uh, vacuum chamber on Friday night, flicked it, and it ringed down over a weekend. Uh, so we've been able to make micro pendula um, by mass loading these nano, these nano ribbons with um, quality factors of the same as the nano ribbon, around 10 to the 6 but with a, your six, 10, a million fold larger moment of inertia, so frequency of, of around 10 Hertz. So this is a, uh, a few microhertz damping rate pendulum on a chip. This is a really sort of amazing device. Uh, if you take the mass off, then you also have very high Q nanomechanical resonators. Actually, they're on the order of 10 to the eight, but they're, they're vibrating at much higher frequency. These are very cool devices. They're sort of, they, the, the physics of these devices, you know, it goes all the way back to 10,000 to 1914 when people were really studying torsion balances and trying to make very high Q uh, torsion suspensions. Um, we've been able to sort of reinterpret this, this old physics of, of uh, bifilar suspension for torsion balances in the context of nanomechanical resonators and make these really high Q uh, torsion beams and loaded torsion beams uh, on the order of 10 to the eight. The interesting thing here is that this scaling is indicative of soft clamping. So these devices have very little average curvature on average at the clamps because torsion modes actually don't have much motion on the clamps um, because of, the, of their, their symmetry. So you get sort of high Q for free. Uh, the wonderful thing about these devices, they have high, very high Q zero point rotation. And that allows you to start studying not quantum limited interferometric measurements, which is center of mass motion, but quantum limited deflect deflection measurements. So actually uh, everyone in optomechanics, or whenever we think about precision measurement of mechanical motion, we typically think of interferometric measurements. However, uh, there are a whole other class of measurements of, uh, uh, of precision displacement measurements um, based on uh, optical deflection. Um, optical deflectometry um, is actually a very standard and robust technique. And for example, atomic force microscopy, the quantum limits of deflectometry have never really been studied because to access the quantum limits of an optical deflection measurement, you need a device which is a very good torque sensor, um, which are very sensitive to radiation pressure torque noise. And these little nano cantilevers that were, these little torsion resonators that we're making are sort of ideal for this. So we're sort of revisiting the quantum limits of deflection measurements 
being able to make really sensitive displacement measurements with imprecision well, well below the zero point motion. And the dream here is to access radiation pressure, shot noise, and torque. And if you can do that, then instead of squeezing the amplitude and phase fluctuations of the light field, you would squeeze its fluctuations of its displacement and deflection. This is spatial squeezing, something which had been discussed in the field of quantum imaging 20 years ago, but never really revisited in the context of optomechanics. Um, one of the things that we're really curious about, though, is just a purely classical application. You take this device, this is my last slide, and uh, it's again a sort of a 10 microhertz resonator uh, with a frequency of 10 hertz on a chip. You flip it upside down, and its frequency shifts by a factor, of, uh, fractionally by a factor of two. And so uh, this little device has a frequency shift just due to gravity of around 10 hertz. Its damping rate is 10 microhertz. So uh, we sort of automate, sort of on a chip for free, have a sensitivity, a spectral resolution to gravity of one, of one part in 10 to the six. Um, so you can really start thinking about these as chip scale gravimeters. Um, and uh, oh, I don't have, I have some more slides on this I can show, but uh, we are really interested in actually uh, cutting the sensitivity down uh, by a couple orders of magnitude and starting to monitor micro seismic noise and even the tides on a chip uh, with these devices. Um, and so, uh, and what I've been, I've been talking with Will today and in the last few weeks about how we might use these devices also to look for, um, to do uh, fundamental tests of say the equivalence principle or near, or, or near field uh, deviations of gravity from Newtonian mechanics. So with that, I'm gonna stop. Thanks. This is an outlook that you guys all know very well. <laughs> Uh, in, in Tucson, though, uh, where it's a little bit more purple. No, it's actually less purple, I'd say, than Phoenix, but maybe a little green. <laughs> and these are all the people I met along the way. So, um, thank, thank you, you. Christelle.